Okay. Good evening, and uh, welcome everybody for the second evening of the Fall Enrichment Program. Uh, so, tonight it's a very special keynote. I'm very honored to welcome uh, Mr. Samuel West, uh, who is, uh, who is uh, going to give us a wonderful, wonderful lecture tonight about the Museum of Failure. So, Samuel uh, got a PhD in uh, organizational psychology. Yeah, it's uh, complicated things, but looks good. Uh, and he's a licensed clinical psychologist. So during his long career, very long career, he, he, go, he, gave, a, he gave a lot of uh, consulting and he advised many companies about how to, how to improve creativity and how to nurture creativity in these companies. So he worked for very large uh, world famous group that I will not name here, but he has been uh, engaged is very, in very transform transformative activities. And he came today, at some point he, come inter he became interested is in uh, how to learn from the mechanism of failure. So we are all convinced that failure is part, is part of the progress and design process, but he developed his own point of view about how to learn from failure and how to use this to, 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 to trigger and to nurture more creativity. So this is going to be his point tonight. So he has, uh, now he has a lot of enthusiasm to share with us. So Samuel, please. Your turn. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, I told you specifically not to overhype this talk because one of the surest way to fail is uh, when something is overhyped and you have too high expectations. So thank you very, very much for that. Mm? Um, yeah, uh, as I said in the introduction, a uh, little background, uh, clinical psychologist. It becomes important towards the end of this talk. It's not important right now. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm an American, but I live in Sweden, <clears throat> if that makes any sense. Um, so a little, just a touch upon uh, my research. Um, it was focused on how organizations can create a climate that facilitates creativity and innovation. Um, and most of my experiments were done on a team level. And my, my thesis was called how playing at work enhances organizational creativity. So how a playful work envi environment, how that uh, benefits uh, and is conductive to creativity. So basically, I took boring meetings. Anybody go to boring meetings here at Coast? Oh, okay. Did you film that? Yeah? <laughs> oh, <woo -hoo. laughs> So the idea is like, if we take these boring uh, meetings at work, and if we just add an element of playfulness, then uh, not only will they be more fun, but these meetings will be more creative. Um, <clears throat> Basically, this, this quote by Wittgenstein summarizes uh, most of my research, much better than my however hundred, hundreds of pages in the thesis does. Um, we have to, there has to be some leeway, um, there has to be a forum, there has to be some acceptance of doing something a little bit silly, foolish maybe, uh, at, at, at the first hand glance, but uh, we have to allow ourselves some degree of leeway to do things that not, might not make complete sense at the beginning. Wittgenstein calls it silliness. I would call it playfulness. Um, if we do that, then there's a good, better chance that something intelligent gets done. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, why am I here? Well, because I got tired of success. Um, I <laughs> I've, I've been reading, how far can I go, up here? I have to, then I have to go all the way over here, okay. Anyway, <laughs> so I got really tired of, of all these success stories. Um, our society worships success. Like uh, in the innovation sort of field, it's a successful entrepreneur, somebody who, or in, in science, it's some, some scientist who discovers a new method, a new uh, technique of some sort, uh, some fantastic theory. Uh, and, and then that person becomes sort of a, a put up on a pedestal of success, and then we worship that person and their success. The problem with this is, A, success 
is not a very good teacher. Just because you read stories about successful business people or scientists doesn't mean you'll be successful. <laughs> There's not much to learn from that. Um, and secondly, I think my main problem with success is that the more we glorify success, the more failure becomes stigmatized. So the more we sort of worship this success, the more we, we shun and we're afraid of, of failure. And that's a, a, a shame, because when it comes to innovation, we need failure. We need to have that space to, to be able to try something, uh, explore some, an avenue that's a dead end, uh, try that business idea that doesn't lead anywhere. Uh, even, <clears throat> so, um, even my wife's sort of women's lifestyle magazine, um, <laughs> <laughs> thumbing through that, even I thought like there would not be any sort of glorified success in those magazines, but believe me, there are. It's like, oh, I lost 10 kilos, I'm so successful, or I quit my boring job at the university and I started a bakery. Um, <clears throat> there's all these stories, uh, um, even, even in the most sort of uh, weird places uh, that still fall into this sort of yeah, a glorification of the success narrative. So I had enough of that, so I started the Museum of Failure. This was, it's in Helsingborg in southern Sweden. It's about an hour from Copenhagen in Denmark. Um, <clears throat> there's about 80, I think we're 70, up to 80 different uh, failed innovations and failed business models, failed uh, technology. Um, and I've really tried to get as a, a wide array of, of, of failures. So it's not just technology. It's not just business models. Um, we've got food. We've got toys. Um, we even have some <clears throat> adult theme um, failures as well. So uh, to, to sort of give a very wide uh, perspective on, on why we need to accept failure if we want innovation and progress. Um, people, we, we opened on June 7th, so it's brand new. Uh, this whole thing of running a museum is still new to me. Uh, and we've had visitors from all over the world, except from Greenland. Um, so if anybody's here from Greenland, then I'd like to see you at the mu No, okay. Uh, the <laughs> didn't think so. <laughs> Your quota for Greenland is not met, right? <laughs> um, and the interesting thing about the Museum of Failure is how wildly successful it became and how quickly it became a phenomena. Uh, I had envisioned the Museum of Failure as being, um, you know, I hope maybe to get a, an article in the local newspaper and in the innovation sort of journals that get a mention about the Museum of Failure, but it, it, it exploded. Um, so, um, it was t when we opened, there was uh, four uh, TV stations doing live broadcasting from the opening of this tiny little museum in an insignificant town in Sweden. It was quite a, really quite amazing. Um, yeah, let's go on. <clears throat> so um, anybody who's uh, familiar with the innovation process knows that there's a thousand of these sort of flow charts and, and models. This is just a random one that I thought looked pretty good, so that's why I chose this one. Um, it's here to illustrate that during the innovation process, you know, there's all these different stages and, and, and um, um, sort of in this cycle, stages that have to be met uh, during the process. At any point during the innovation process, uh, there's a giant risk for failure. Um, and the, 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 the story of success is almost always the same, and I'm, that's what I'm so tired of. Hey, look at me. I, uh, I'm a cool guy. I had a great business idea or a great sort of technology uh, um, idea. I, I got some funding. Uh, now I'm a billionaire. Look at me. Look how succe successful I am. Or a successful product launch is sort of the similar story. And you never hear about the failures. They're always sort of swept under the carpet. And I truly believe that the failures are much more interesting than uh, the success stories. You might recognize this quote because I've stolen it. Um, <clears throat> I like to take quotes from famous people uh, and then just tweak them a little bit and then take full credit for it myself. <laughs> this one is uh, Leo Tolstoy. He wrote, um, all happy families are alike. 
But every unhappy family is unhappy in their own special way. And I love that quote <laughs> because it fits so well in with the theme of, of the museum. Uh, that um, it's in the stories of failure that we, it's interesting, they're nuanced, and it's in those stories that we can learn uh, about the innovation process, we can learn uh, so much from, you know, from our own fields and from other uh, perspectives. This is a, I don't know where I stole this from, maybe I made it up myself. Um, <clears throat> this is all over the museum, we have it um, all over the windows and the walls, that uh, the, you know, the, the message of the museum is that we need to accept failure if we want progress, um, and we have to be able to accept uh, our own failures as well, and the failures of our, our, of our team. Um, and the only way we can, the only thing we can do to turn these failures into some sort of success is if we learn from them. Um, this is not to be confused with sort of sugarcoating failure with corporate bullshit or nice terms and then claiming that they are a success, because that's easy to do. It takes much more to actually admit that, hey, I screwed up um, and this is what I've learned from my experiences. Okay. Um, so diving into some of the things here at the museum, um, <clears throat> the segways at the museum, and how many people here have tried the segway? Okay, a handful, yeah. Um, so it's cool, huh? Or what, you weren't impressed? Yeah, okay, it was okay. <laughs> the the Sega, when it came out in 2001, it was a revolution. It was really, really awesome. Um, and it, you know, it's a completely new technology. The inventor got a lot of publicity, of course. And the Silicon Valley, you know, the big boys of Silicon Valley, they threw money at the Segway. Um, the expectations were enormous. So the Segway, I'll throw out some quotes, and then you can just get a feeling for what the expectation was for the Segway in 2001. <clears throat> and the, the Segway will be the first product in history to reach one billion US in sales within one year. Okay? I got more. Um, <laughs> the, the Segway will be to the car what the car was to the horse and buggy. Yeah, I'm just warming up here. <laughs> uh, this is the best one. In the future, city infrastructure will be built around the Segway. <laughs> okay, so we all know none of this happened. <laughs> um, the Segway was too expensive. It was initially it was like claimed it was deemed to be unsafe. Um, it was extremely and still is extremely impractical as any kind of transport. Um, it might work for security guards or for as a fun thing to do. Um, but as a transport uh, device, it's quite limited. Um, and this is why it's at the Museum of Failure, because it, the expectations for the Segway were enormous, and it met none of those expectations. So according to the academic definition of failure, the Segway is the perfect candidate for the Museum of Failure. Are you with me on this one? Yeah? <clears> okay, <throat> so... Um, <laughs> This is when I applied for funding for the Museum of Failure from the Swedish Innovation Fund. It's a very bureaucratic sort of, are we filming this? No? It's not, it's not out, no, okay. So it's a very boring bureaucratic organization. Uh, <laughs> and they, but I needed their money. <laughs> so I, um, I'm like, hey, I'm gonna start the Museum of Failure. Um, it's really cool, it's the first Museum of Failure in the world. Um, give me some money. Um, and then they said, they're up, based up in Stockholm in Sweden, and they, they wrote back and like, okay, this is a great idea. Here's the money. Um, but our committee that decided it, that you get the money, we have to inform you that Stockholm already has a museum of failure. And what they meant was that this is the Vasa Museum in Stockholm. The Vasa Museum is a mu the, the, the number one tourist destination in Sweden. It's, an, it's the Vasa ship that, had been, that has been um, salvaged and um, turned into a museum. And the whole story of the Vasa is fascinating. So this is, this is in the 1600s. 
Uh, the king of, that was when Sweden was like a, a, a powerful kingdom, which it is definitely not today, um, except for Ikea maybe. But um, <laughs> So they will get to Ikea again later on. Um, so the, the Vasa ship, uh, the king of Sweden said, hey, uh, um, let's, let's build the most powerful, awesome warship on earth. All right, let's do this thing. Um, they, they build it. The engineers, there was no expense. Uh, they, 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 they went all in. Um, the engineers, they, because there was, the innovation was, you can't see it here because it's sinking, but there's two decks, there's two floors of, of, of cannons, right? So the ship's very top-heavy. All right, now, the engineers, they knew that the boat or the ship was unstable. But the king, the CEO, he's like, we got a war in Poland. We got to get this, this boat launched. We're going to do it anyway. Just, just tell them to fix it, you know? All right? The admiral, the marketing director, <laughs> he's like... Oh, it's unstable? I don't care. We gotta launch. We've already booked the food trucks and the band. We gotta get this ship launched. <laughs> so, um, and the engineer's like, no, it's not stable. Ah, throw some more ballast, some more rocks in there, make it, you know, balance out the, 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 the weight. They launch it. It was a big party. The, the ship makes it barely out into the harbor, and then there's a little bit of wind, <laughs> and then the boat sink, sinks right there, right in front of everybody. It's a huge embarrassment. So um, why am I telling you the story of the Vasa ship? Well, because this is almost 400 years ago, and the lesson that they should have learned, we should have learned, is don't launch stuff innovations before they're ready, before they're tested. Listen to the engineers. If it doesn't work, fix it before you launch it. Is, it. is that so complicated? Apparently it is. This is 350 some odd years later. This is Apple. They launched, they did the same mistake as the Vasa ship. So Apple, um, they had their revolutionary uh, personal sort of digital assistant very sexy device, well-designed, cool thing. Um, the main feature here is that there's no keyboard. So you use a stylus, and you can use your own handwriting to enter data. Now, today, that's just like no big deal. But then it was really, really awesome. And um, so Apple, as they have always done, like, oh, this is a revolution. But in this case, it really was. Uh, the engineers. They said, the handwriting recognition doesn't work. <laughs> it's, not, it's not fully developed. The CEO, the marketing director, the whole executive sort of board, they're like, we're going to launch this anyway. We'll just update the software later. Good one. Um, they launch it. Uh, people buy it for a lot of money, uh, have high expectations. It's awesome piece of technology. It doesn't take them long to realize that this handwriting recognition doesn't work. <laughs> uh, everybody made fun of the Newton. The Simpsons made fun of the Newton. <laughs> series in, in the newspapers. Uh, comedians had a heyday with it. Are you, that, that people spent so much money on ex expensive technology that doesn't work. In fact, the Apple Newton, the word Newton, became synonymous with technology that doesn't work. It's not really what you want to have associated with your name. Okay, so th we don't learn from history, which we probably should. Here's a, uh, one of my, fa I'm going to say this, it, one of my favorites, because I like all of the things here. This is the Itera plastic bicycle. It was supposed to revolutionize Swedish, uh, the Swedish bicycle industry. Um, it's made out of plastic. This is 1982. The plastic was really exciting back then. Um, it's a beautiful bike. Um, there were some problems with it, though. Um, it was called the Everlasting Machine because it doesn't rust. That's cool. Some problems, though. It doesn't rust, but the, the, the handlebars and the saddle break. So that's one problem. <laughs> um, the, another problem was that it was supposed to be half the price of, of regular bicycles because it's plastic. 
it turned out that the production costs were twice as high. So the bike cost twice as much as a regular bike. It's not so good. Um, and the biggest problem with the Itera bicycle is <laughs> that the frame and, and plastic material, it's not stable. It's not rigid enough. So when you bike, it wobbles like. <laughs> so somebody, somebody described it very well. They said, the Itera bicycle, it is built like a, it looks like a crocodile, but it moves like an anaconda. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> this is a uh, Nintendo Virtual Boy. Um, there was a lot of excitement back in the, in the late 80s, the, the, the early 90s, about 3D, um, virtual reality. And Nintendo jumped on the bandwagon. They spent millions developing the Virtual Boy. So um, it's, uh, it's a gaming console. Um, there was a lot of issues with it. One issue was people expected it to be something you would strap onto your, on, your, on your head. And in fact, it's designed to be on a, on a tabletop. So to play the game, you have to sort of like stand like this and stare into the, into the device. Not, not great. Um, the games were only in red. Uh, so <laughs> that was also a problem. Uh, there weren't that many games. Uh, people got headaches after more than five or 10 minutes of playing it. And you know, you think computer games, you know, you think of kids. Um, so it was, there was a warning label on it. Kids under 10 years old couldn't use it because it causes eye damage. <laughs> Great. Um, so Nintendo learned that, you know, it's good to get excited about new technology, but don't, maybe don't get carried away by it. Um, be realistic. And the interesting thing about the Virtual Boy is that Nintendo has been very unusually open about it. They've been open about it. We failed. We spent a lot of money on it, but we also learned a lot. And we could t they took the technology uh, and the, what they've learned from what they learned from this project into their uh, later, much more successful products. Um, so yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> this is uh, Donald Trump, the game. It's, uh, imagine uh, Monopoly, you know what Monopoly is, yeah. Uh, take, take Monopoly and make it so simple that it's just impossibly stupid to play, right? <laughs> That's the Donald Trump board game. Uh, <laughs> It's, we, we tried to play it at the museum, and it was absolutely, there was some TV crew, and we're like, yeah, yeah, we'll play it. And we tried to follow the rules. It was absolutely impossible. Uh, <laughs> the Donald Trump board game comes, of course, with a huge picture of Donald Trump on the, on the cover. Um, you can't see the money here, but the money has big Donald Trump faces on it as well. And the lowest uh, bill in the Donald Trump game is $10 million, Trump, Trump dollars, of course. Um, you can see that the little gaming sort of pieces have T on it, and instead of a six, there's a T for, for Trump, because he's, he's very successful. Um, it, the, the, the funny thing about the Donald Trump game is that it didn't fail once, it failed twice. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely wonderful. <laughs> I also have, I don't have pictures of it, but I have for a, a coming exhibit, I have the Donald Trump University. Uh, university textbooks for Donald Trump University. They're not actually books, they're audio books. Because <laughs> you can't really read if you go to Donald Trump University. All right, enough about that. <laughs> um, this is uh, Blockbuster. How many are familiar with Blockbuster? Oh, okay, good. This, yeah. Um, so Blockbuster, this is, so the other examples have been technology. Donald Trump one is just silly, but um, this is a good case of how, uh, how uh, the business model plays into innovation and survival uh, on the market. Um, so Blockbuster was huge. It had 9,000 stores all over the world. That's humongous. And they were a profit machine. So there was plenty of money here. Um, so... How did, so um, Blockbuster, with all their money, um, they knew that the future was streaming. They knew that it was internet streaming, and they, um, they invested in internet streaming technology. Um, 
And then what happened was that the board of directors were like, hey, how do we make money on the streaming? Because they made most of their money how? Late fees, yeah. 37% of their profits came from late fees. And they punished customers for returning their DVD movies late. So the board of, direct the, the, the board of directors, are like, the directors are like, hey, um, I, with the internet streaming, we can't charge late fees. So they fired the CEO who, who wanted to um, invest more into internet, internet streaming and got a guy on board, a new CEO, who said yes to the board of directors and didn't argue, a yay-sayer. Uh, they killed the internet streaming, and a few years later, Netflix killed Blockbuster. And it was interesting that Netflix, their original slogan was the end of late fees. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> so they had the money, they had the technology, they even knew that this was the future, but their greediness and their reluctance to change their business model uh, um, led, to, led to their demise. Let's check the time here. All right. Um, one more. This is pretty, it's pretty bad right here. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to ask how many in here have had a lobotomy because I... <laughs> um, this is the orbitoclast. Um, it was an innovation in the neurosurgery of uh, the uh, lobotomy. Uh, it is, it was, lobotomy was a procedure used on mental patients where you basically destroy the prefrontal cortex of a person's brain. Um, and it makes the per turns the person into a, a passive sort of vegetable. Um, horrible procedure, but very popular. They got the Nobel Prize for the, pr the procedure, the, the surgeon that invented it. Um, so the original lobotomy was about you had to you had to take the patient and, and drill a hole in their skull, and and then you had to stick in a wire, a certain syringe wire, and sort of mush up the brain. Is this gross? A little bit, yeah. It gets it gets more gross. So um, <laughs> uh, and then you had to drill another hole on the other side and do the same thing. Well, this took a lot of time, and it was quite. I mean, it was a it was a a, a pretty big procedure and a lot of patients died. Um, so this doctor in the States, uh, Walter Freeman, he's like, hmm, how can we do this faster? So he developed the orbiter class. It's basically an ice pick, a big metal, sort of sharp metal tool with a little hammer. And basically what you do is you, you, you hammer the, the big ice pick into the patient's skull behind their eye. That's why it's called the orbiter class, crush the skull behind the, the eye. You just slam it in there seven centimeters, wiggle it around to destroy the brain, um, and then pull it out and repeat on the other side. Is that gross? Yeah. Hugely popular. Um, not amongst the patients, though. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> so so um, the, the tools, I have the, the orbiter class tools at the museum. And the reason they're there, because the, the tools themselves were hugely successful. Um, instead of spending, you know, an hour or two on, per patient, they could just operate patients, you know, 15 minutes. They, you know, some countries they have ice cream trucks that drive around. They used to have lobotomy trucks <laughs> that would visit mental hospitals, and they would just um, uh, do these procedures really fast and efficient. Great technology, great innovation, but a huge failure for the patients. I mean, not only did a lot of them die, uh, and they had complications, the procedure itself was absolutely horrible. Horrible. All right. Another pharmaceutical, just, I'll just mention it. This was a, in, it's from Pfizer, um, one of the biggest pharmaceutical failures, innovation failures. They, it was a new, uh, instead of um, uh, people with diabetes, instead of having to do in, um, um, insulin injections, um, they, uh, Pfizer developed an inhalable insulin. So just like asthma medicine, you know, <laughs> Uh, you could do the same thing uh, to inhale insulin. Ah, fantastic uh, innovation. Um, there were some failures, though, on the actual product and the delivery. One of the, one of the big ones was that this device is quite big. It's like that big. So the syringe, the insulin syringe, is tiny. It's like a pen. 
So would you walk around with this big device in your bag just to avoid the, the, the syringe? Patients were like, yeah, maybe not. It was also very difficult to, to get the dosage right. Um, got a couple more here. Uh, this one is good. It's just toothpaste. I mean, basically, it is toothpaste. Um, Swedish toothpaste from late 60s. There's only one detail here that's worth noting, and that is that Bofors is the Sweden's biggest weapons manufacturer. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't work out very well, sending mixed message there. When there was rumors started that the, that the, that the toothpaste was, had dangerous chemicals in it, um, it, was, it wasn't true, but it was very difficult for Beaufort that makes torpedoes and cannons and stuff to say, no, 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 it's safe. We believe us, it's safe. You know, people weren't buying that. This one is also good. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> what were they thinking? <laughs> this, um, yeah, um, you got a good brand, Colgate, uh, and in the, according to the literature in the 80s, they, they branched out and started to you know, try to use their, their good brand to sell other products, like frozen dinners. Um, this is the only company that's threatened to sue me. I don't know why. I mean, it's it's their it's their product. <laughs> I got a phone call. F I was from New. I could see it was a New York number, and it was right during you know, the the most intense media coverage. So I assumed it was some hotshot, you know, reporter. So I was all excited when I answered the phone. I'm like, yeah, yeah. And they're like, I represent Colgate. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Um, this is actually the only product in the museum that's a reconstruction. We don't, that's not the original. So we don't, it's, it's based on, this, on the sources of brand failures. Uh, so uh, my intern made the, the, this, this reconstruction of the box. We don't actually even know if it was lasagna, but it was some kind of frozen dinner. So maybe that's why Colgate's pissed off. All right, let, one last one. Uh, Twitter Peak, it's a single-use device, 2009. that can only tweet. It doesn't do anything else. 2009, everyone already had smartphones. So if you use Twitter, you already had the Twitter app. So why would you buy this? <laughs> um, there was a tech reviewer who wrote, the Twitter peak is so dumb that it makes my brain hurt. <laughs> I agree, it's stupid. OK, um, I mentioned that we'd get back to IKEA here. Uh, I did a talk for a couple hundred of IKEA's top management, and I was a bit nervous. Um, but then I decided that you know I have to give them something interesting, uh, so I found this. This is a failure, mega failure from IKEA. It uh, you know they had their flat packages, that's their trademark, uh, and they, in the 80s and again in the 90s they experimented with inflatable furniture. Now this sounds like a great idea. You can buy flat packages, you know, like a, a, a sofa, um, <laughs> blow it up. <laughs> And then you have a fantastic couch. It's easy. You can vacuum under it. You, I mean, it's cheap. You know, it's, it's I guess, somewhat beautiful some, somehow. It was just several problems. The main problem was, can you imagine that you have two beautiful couches there? It looks all cool. You're, you're a proud owner of these two IKEA couches. And then you open two windows in your house. <laughs> Your couches are moving around. <laughs> uh, yeah, it didn't work out very well for IKEA. <laughs> so um, all these stories, um, both in my talks and in the museum, as don't miss the pop-up museum, um, the, I try really hard not to be to explain too much. I, wanna, I, want, I want to stimulate interest. And I want people to uh, draw their own conclusions, what they learn from it. Because I've found, when I've given tours at the museum, i found that we learn the most from the failures that are not immediately associated to our areas. So if I have a group of engineers come in, I don't just focus on the engineering failures, because they learn just as much from the food uh, innovation failures or the business model failures. So to, to discover something new um, uh, 
uh, you know, the, the, about your field can often come from an, uh, a, a, you know, a source you wouldn't really expecting it to come from. So, um, when it, if we, if these different examples, um, they teach us that you know, these, these companies that are at the museum, sometimes I get asked, uh, isn't it embarrassing uh, that these companies are represented, Google, Apple, and Microsoft, all these big companies, that they're represented at the Museum of Failure. And if you think about it a, a little bit, the, the, the really embarrassing thing, uh, it's, the most embarrassing thing is, is for companies that are not at the museum, because it means that they're not innovative. Because if you're innovative, you're going to fail, and you're going to fail a lot, and it's going to cost a lot of money. So there's nothing really embarrassing about being in the museum, even if the companies would rather not be there. Um, and this is sort of what the Harvard Business Review uh, special issue on failure was trying to convey, that there's a lot of hypocrisy going on. We, we talk about failure, at least in the innovation business, um, talk about failure, oh, you gotta fail forward, you gotta um, uh, fail better, smarter, quicker. Um, there's a lot of sort of cliches about nice slogans and, 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 and quotations, inspirational quotes about failure. But when it comes down to the reality, we're still afraid of it, and we still avoid it, and we still find it extremely embarrassing. And we do everything to sort of deny our own failures, or the failures of our team. Um, and the sad thing is that a lot of organizations, if not most organizations, they also punish failure. And this is, this is interesting because on the one hand, the organizations, it doesn't matter if it's a university or it's a, you know, a tech company or any type of organization at all. And I did a talk for Red Cross, even NGOs have to be innovative. Um, and so it's paradoxical. So on the one hand, be innovative, take meaningful risks. But then on the other hand, you know, don't fail. That, that those two things don't go very well together. In fact, they don't go together at all. Um, so if we want an innovative culture, and we want true you know, d innovation and progress, we need to create a culture that accepts failure. Not glorifies failure, but accepts failure and uses failure as an opportunity to, to learn. Okay. Um, 10 minutes more, is that okay? So um, the, there are some cultural differences when it comes to sort of the, the acceptance of failure and willingness to deal with it. Um, many people, they glorify Silicon Valley. So like, oh yeah, California, uh, Western, West Coast, USA, uh, they really got it right because they embrace failure. Um, you know, the Silicon Valley motto, fail forward, you've probably heard of it before. Um, so, in many ways, that's true that they, West Coast United States and other startup sort of uh, um, um, hubs, they they do have an, a, a better acceptance of failure than most other uh, organizations or, or areas. But but Silicon Valley is not any better than any other area culture when it comes to learning from failure. They make the same mistakes over and over again. So they're better at accepting failure, but they're not any better at learning from it, which I, I feel like I have to remind people because otherwise we glorify uh, Silicon Valley a little bit too much. Um, in Europe, there's differences. So up in Sweden, where I'm at, in Denmark, even the Netherlands, and to some degree the United Kingdom, there's a sort of a, it's not okay, it's not like, oh yeah, it's fine to fail, but there's a greater sort of ease to which we can talk about it and, and even some, sometimes admit it. And as you've traveled south in Europe and specifically in France, uh, <coughs> uh, <laughs> I should be careful, I still haven't gotten paid for this gig yet. No. <laughs> so, um, there's a reluctance, there's a lot of hierarchy, and there's a reluctance to both talk about um, failure in organizations, and of course that makes it very difficult to learn from failure. Uh, at the museum, so far, the, the, num the country that's, o that's represented the most as far as organizational groups is uh, Germany and France. So there's a lot of interest there, like we need to, get, we need to improve our learning from failure, um, and insight is always the first step. Um, the, Asian cultures, um, I, 
worked a lot in China and experience from Japan, where the um, there's a, a, a much stronger, uh, more powerful social uh, stigma associated with failure. So you do not fail, and if you do, you 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 don't you do everything to not own up to it. Um, the interest from China for the museum has been absolutely uh, spectacular. Um, first, I thought it was because of my deep knowledge about learning from failure and 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 conveying, uh, um, you know. Uh, research about learning from failure and, and, and the innovation process, but then I realized it was because of the Donald Trump game um, that people were interested in. <laughs> um, and also that they, uh, they, they really like to see, uh, you know, failures from the West to say, oh, you guys aren't that great. <laughs> I kind of like that. Um, the most interesting discussion I've had uh, when it comes to the cultural differences was from a group that came from... Uh, Central Africa. So there was a, a group that came to visit the museum and, and they had on their colorful, cool um, um, African clothes. Uh, and they stayed three hours. The average visitor stays about an hour and they stayed three hours. And we're like, you know, what, 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 you know, why? <laughs> Is it, are the texts difficult to read or what's going on here, you know? Uh, no, um, they were convinced. Uh, Sort of, and very enthusiastic, saying that in their region, in their culture, they need a museum of failure, because it was explained to me that you know, in 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 European or Swedish culture, there, if you fail, it's embarrassing for you and maybe your immediate you know family, and it's quite temporary. Um, they said that in their uh, culture, if you fail, even if you're doing something innovative, if you fail, it's not only you that suffer, it's passed on to future generations. That would make you think twice before taking a risk, even if it's a very meaningful risk. So I thought that was very interesting. And they, they, they obviously don't represent all of Africa, but I thought it was an interesting uh, take on it. So is there an exception to the rule that organizations uh, are really bad at learning from failure. Uh, yes, it's the aviation industry. Um, they, when there's a failure there, when an airplane crashes, they don't just accept the first best explanation. So when there's a plane crash, what happened? Okay, it was bad weather. So that's an explanation that most of us in our different organizations and teams, we would say, okay, that's a good answer. Yeah, it was bad weather, and we would write that in the report, and it's over. The aviation industry doesn't stop there. They look for second, third, fourth level of analysis, um, where they, they look for the factors like, why did the pilot fly if it was bad weather? That's a good question. Is there a culture in the, at, with the airline to save money and being delayed because of weather costs money? Okay, then that's the problem that, that enabled or, 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 or um, uh, increased the risk that the pilot would fly in risky weather. Um, this is an example from San Francisco uh, several years ago. Brand new airplane, two experienced pilots, beautiful day, nothing wrong. The plane lands, crashes. People die. It's horrible. The um, is that a signal that I'm supposed to be done now? Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, the the um, what happened? The first explanation was that um, the autopilot didn't warn the, the the computer system didn't warn the pilots that the plane was landing too slowly. So for like I said, most of us that would be a, oh well, that's definitely we found the error here. And that would be the end of it. It wasn't in this case when during the investigation they found out that it wasn't only that that it, that's that's like quite routine. The problem was that in the cockpit, the co-pilot that was landing this plane, he felt that there was something wrong. He sensed it. He knew it. He was sitting what 50, 30 centimeters from an experienced captain, and he didn't dare ask the captain. For input. He didn't dare say anything. Are you following me on this? This is horrible. <laughs> so 
the, the, another sort of understanding of this, of this crash, uh, or the investigation, was that one of the reasons why the plane crashed, probably the prim primary reason, was the, 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 the perceived safety in the cockpit, like the, the team climate of, in the cockpit. If there was a climate where it was okay to ask questions, where it was okay to not know everything, where it was okay to share information and not let your prestige get in the way, then this, uh, uh, this crash would never have happened. It's exactly what Google found out uh, two, I think it's about two years ago, they released a huge study on what characterizes high-performing innovative teams. And what they found was psychological safety was the absolutely the most uh, uh, powerful predictor or an characteristic. They, um, psychological safety is a perceived sense within the team that it's, that it's okay to admit your own failure, it's okay to be vulnerable, it's okay to not be super, super, super competent and professional all the time, it's okay to take interpersonal risk. It's a, it's a, sense, it's a sense that when you do so, you won't be punished uh, by, your, by other team members or the, the team leader. Um, here's some questions, I won't go through them, so if you wanna take a photo, go ahead and do it now, if you wanna steal these. <laughs> This is a, a, a brief assessment from uh, Amy Edmondson, uh, and it sort of gives a sort of a rough and quick and dirty sort of view of, or measure of the degree of psychological safety in a, in a team. Okay, I'm gonna click it now. <laughs> so um, how, can we, how can we increase psychological safety in our teams? Um, there's not really that much advice, but one thing is to frame our tasks more as learning tasks rather than just execution. So if, if there's something difficult we're working on um, and we need the whole team, then frame it that way. Say, we, we, we've never done this before. Uh, we need the entire team's input here uh, to do this together. B, to, if you're a team leader, um, then acknowledge your own fallibility. Uh, be a good example. So um, you don't... You don't have to overdo this, but you, just to show that, hey, I, I also screw up sometimes, despite being the boss. Um, uh, model questions, so uh, ask a lot of questions, not just nonsense questions to keep you know, conversation going, but questions that need to be asked, like why are we doing this? You know, Uncomfortable questions, is there a better way to do this? Um, the fourth point is more from me, not from Harvard University, and that's um, to, when you see somebody in your team that's sort of demonstrating any of these behaviors, um, be a little bit of a cheerleader. Reinforce, uh, sort of acknowledge and reinforce that behavior. Don't be, so, don't, when, you, when somebody acknowledges their fallibility or says something that sort of opens up their vulnerability, don't roll your eyes and sort of, or laugh it off in a trivial way. Be, be you know, embrace that and encourage that. And then the fifth, and this is, of course, as any other researcher, you have to force your research findings on everything, right? So uh, that's mine on number, point number five. Um, a, a team that has fun together and a team that has shared sort of fun, uh, engaging experiences together, they have a buffer. So they have like a margin there. So when things go, you know, get tough, and when things start to go wrong, they still have sort of a... a, a a, a buffer of, of positive emotions and shared experiences there. So it's much easier to take criticism or to talk about your own failure, for example, if you've had uh, a lot of shared positive experiences with that person. Does this make any sense? The last one, yeah? Thank you. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that was it. Thank you very much. Should we do questions, or are we out of time, or? Yeah, you have the plenty of time here for the questions. <laughs> questions? <laughs> I want to throw it. Uh, <laughs> I have a question. No, it's very far. Uh, <laughs> all right, all right. Let's try this. Everybody in the way here, you're gonna get. You're gonna get this. <laughs> yeah, that was a failure. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's why I went into academia. I can't play sports. <laughs> right. 
Okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's a very interesting uh, topic. Uh, my question is, when do you have to punish failure? Are you saying you never supposed to punish it? And then if you should, how? That was an awesome question because there, the thing is, you, you want a high accountability within the organization and the team. So you don't want people to be failing because of sloppiness or just because of dissent or because of, of any other number of reasons, you know, incompetence. You, you, you can't accept that failure, but you should always accept failure when somebody is taking on a meaningful risk, when they're dealing with a high level of uncertainty. So, so when it comes to innovation, we don't know what's going to work. So if somebody on your team spends too much money or time on something that turns out to be a failure, that can never be punished or shouldn't be punished. However, if somebody, does some, if somebody fails because of sloppiness or they just don't care, then of course that, I mean, that's not failure in the service of innovation. That's just failure because of sloppiness. And of course there should be you know, measures taken there. So, there's, so basically, if the person is dealing with something that's, that's a high level of in, uh, uncertainty, uh, ambiguity, then you you shouldn't punish. You shouldn't you should encourage failure there because that's the only way forward. Does it, does it make sense? There's quite a yeah. bit of literature on this as well. Yeah. One question here. All right, you got to catch it. Though. If you want to ask a question, you have to catch it. Whoa! <laughs> Yeah, just talk into the magic box. Um, how did you get the idea of the Museum of Failure? Good one. Um, the <laughs> I was actually, I don't like museums because I can't, I think they're quite boring. A bunch of stuff and a bunch of text to read, so I don't really go to museums. Um, but I went to a museum about a year ago uh, in Zagreb in, in uh, Croatia. And the museum was called the Museum of Broken Relationships. <laughs> Google it. It's awesome. It's the only museum in the world that's better than my museum. <laughs> and when I saw that museum, it was such a cool idea that they had, and it was so simple. They just had stuff and then short, short, short text, because I, I don't like long texts. Um, then I got inspired, like, hey, I can also do a museum. And then I... First thing I thought, okay, I'm going to make, I'm going to start Museum of Failure. And the first thing I did was I, I, um, I went down to a pub and had a Saudi champagne. Uh, <laughs> and then I went on my phone and I bought www.museumoffailure.com, right? Because you have to have a website. Um, and then three days later, I got the invoice to pay for it. And it said, congratulations, you are now the owner of museumoffailure.com. <laughs> so I couldn't even spell museum. <laughs> yeah, that's embarrassing. <laughs> I'll make t-shirts, museumoffailure.com. <laughs> One more? You have to throw it. Look behind you and throw it to the... Come on. Oh. Oh. <laughs> You're only off by one row, so that's fine. So there's been various talk around in academia, and there's, I know there's at least one professor here who has talked about it before, um, about publishing scientific failure, experiments yeah. that didn't work. Yeah. But there seems to be a big block there. <laughs> Academics have this reluctancy to yeah, share They like to keep things. them in a drawer instead, yeah. yeah. Mm. Do you think this is something that in the future, as we accept failure more, will be a thing, or do you think there's always going to be that block? Uh, well, not if I can help it, because uh, I just, we just, we're in the process of starting the, the Journal of Insignificant Results. Uh, <laughs> so, it's a great title. It's a great title. Uh, <laughs> nobody steal it, okay? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, that, we all know that that's a, that's a huge problem in academia, where you only publish positive results, and at least in my 
I won't speak for you guys, but in, <laughs> in the social sciences, we, uh, we like to massage our data and our statistics until we get positive results. Um, standard practice. Uh, and that turn, it, 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 you know, it, it screws up the whole, the whole idea. Uh, but it, it sort of screws up the whole idea with science when we start massaging the data and, and only focus on uh, significant, statistically significant results. Um, so I, I hope that it would change, and I hope that I can be part of that, and that every single academic in here will publish in the Journal of Insignificant Results. I, it'll be peer-reviewed and all that good stuff, and highly ranked, and, <laughs> and you'll become a professor soon because you publish in it, yeah. <laughs> So you have to be the one person that can get to the right person. Okay. Don't fail now. <laughs> Come on. Really one, two, three, two. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Um, I think there is a journal of negative results already, which is a complete failure because nobody sends <laughs> works there. So you may want to reconsider. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I have one submission or from, no? of the Journal of Insignificant Results? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> More questions? So, uh, one personal question. I, I didn't see a single French product in your museum, so I'm sure you don't okay. want to say that French are not innovative. Okay, so, so uh, I'm gonna go way over here. <laughs> um, so, so give me at least two I have French. many French products. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I have, at the pop-up museum, there's the big pen for her. Is there any st more stupid idea? No, I don't think so. It's definitely French. And then I have, <laughs> and then I have the uh, Minitel. Me Can you explain what the Minitel was? Uh, Come on. It's, it was just, I mean, it was a great investment from the Ministry of Communication before the internet. Uh, where you were getting everything, I mean, I mean you, you, were, you were able to look at your, your result for the diploma, to look for a restaurant, anything? Yeah. Like, yeah, so it was a pre-version of internet. It was yeah. actually really, really awesome. So there's nothing failure about the Minitel. Um, you could buy train tickets, you could, you know, uh, concerts, you can yeah. uh, search for number, uh, phone numbers. Great piece of technology. The problem was, and this is pretty cool or interesting, the French, because they're so nationalistic, when the internet, the rest of the world was adapting and adopting internet, the French said, no, we have the Minitel from 1981. Yeah. We're going to keep it. And there's a lot of theories that say that the Minitel, it was really good in the 80s and 90s, but the, because of the Minitel, France was delayed in internet adoption by 15 years. It's pretty impressive. Mm. So it, was, it was not a failure, it was a short-term I, success. But, was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, yeah, um, yeah, we'll discuss this later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, more questions? <laughs> yeah. A pro ooh. No, Minitel was not a failure. I knew this would be a discussion. So, <laughs> Minitel was not a failure, it was a huge success. But yeah. because of the reluct because they had the French had this great technology that was great, you know, in the eighties yeah. and early nineties, they like I said, they were delayed by fifteen years. Yeah. One year, not yeah. no, but you see, what I mean, it's very it's very When easy. is my airplane home? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but you know, so it's, what you can see, it's very easy for French to accept failure. We don't yeah. agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, more one, one question. Back uh, where is the... Okay, throw. Go. Whoa! <laughs> Do you Good dare hold it now? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you very much uh, for your talk. It was absolutely extraordinary and uh, so um, educational. And I like how you rehabilitate failure. We talked about <laughs> it yesterday. But what I'm interested in, I have looked into uh, your website and all the um, branches you, you venture into, and I came across your super lab. 
And I was very interested in how you convey those ideas into graph in design, because I saw that you were doing that, but there was no example of, yeah. of what exactly that entails. Well, um, so the, I mean, in, in whether it's product development, new product development, or if you're doing you know, graphic design or interior design, even there, even if it's not disruptive mega innovation, it's still, you're trying to be creative within those con con confines. And so a lot of the sort of, um, uh, the, the principles of playfulness and the principles of not being afraid, not, not too afraid of failure, does actually guide us in like, what, what the projects that we take, um, that we accept at Superlab. Uh, the, the Museum of Failure was a Superlab sort of idea from the beginning when we started working with it. Did I answer the question, or am I? Yeah. You had examples of how do you apply it to your I don't. I, I don't do the graphic design myself. So I don't have any great examples there. But there's plenty of b great examples of bad graphic design. So there's been suggestions that there should be a, a complete sort of guest exhibit at the Museum of Failure for bad design. Uh, we already have an, uh, a Department of Ar uh, Architecture uh, a professor who's working on a subdivision of the, of the Museum of Failure for failed architecture. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so one of them of the failures there is the whole um, sort of modernism within architecture. Um, there's some theories of some ideas, provocative ones of how that sort of is a big failure in and of itself. I can't claim to understand all of that, but I think it's interesting. There's all kinds of different ways. You can do the, the there's social innovation failure, so there's plenty of different social projects that have failed miserably. Uh, the intentions are really good, but um, the implementation and the effects are bad. So um, there's all kinds of different examples of how the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That would be an interesting uh, uh, exhibit. Hmm? Okay, I didn't fail now. <laughs> um, if your museum failed, would you put that in the Museum of Failure? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you bet I will. <laughs> that would be awesome. The Museum of Failure is a failure. <laughs> End. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, Samuel is going to give a couple of tours tomorrow, anyway, for the small pop-up exhibition from the Museum of Failure. And then if you get interested, I'm sure you can fly to, to your place, right, to visit yeah. the real one. Uh, so just a couple of announcements. Uh, this evening, right after the event here, uh, you are going to, there is the opening of the Mangrove exhibition in the library. And at 7, and then at 7.30, there is the last storytelling with Sam. Where is Sam? Sam is there. So for people who want to get a last storytelling session at, at 7.30 in front of the library tonight, uh, so you are all welcome. Uh, and I think that's pretty much everything we wanted to say, right? Okay, so thank you very much, Samuel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>